This is our second message in becoming consistent, persistent Bible reading leaders. Now, the Lord has called us to shepherd his people, and that's just a beautiful image. And throughout this website, we've talked about this many times. So I want to look just briefly at the four aspects of shepherding, because we are to do our work with Holy Scripture. And that's our point, Holy Scripture and the elders' work. Scripture is our tool. It's our instrument. It's the means by which we do the shepherding task. Let's just look at the four aspects very, very briefly. Protect the flock by the word of God. There is a real emphasis in scripture on the elders protecting the church from wolves, from false teaching. How do we do this? Well, our instrument is the word of God. It is truth. Only by the word of God do we even know what's true or what's false. Or can we spot a false teacher who often they're very, very subtle. So it is the word of God that protects the church. We need to know it and we need to be able to identify false teachers and we need to be able to use it to correct false teaching. I might want to say to you that false teaching is literally exploding throughout the world in in an unprecedented way. Even cult watchers say they have never seen anything like this. A lot of this happens through the internet, through uh, many avenues of the media. So we need to be awake to this great job that we have, protect God's people from false teachers to be able to define the gospel, defend the gospel, and we do it by the knowledge of the word of God. And then feed people the word of God. In Paul's closing message to the Ephesian elders, in verse 27, he makes one of the most important statements that every elder needs to know. He says this, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. What is the job of elders? It is to teach and to feed God's people the whole counsel of God, not just our little hobby horse uh, doctrines that we like. Paul says, I've taught you everything, everything you needed to know, the whole redemptive story, starting with Genesis 1-1 going to Revelation 22. Our job is to feed the people. If you go back to the Old Testament, it's illustrated for us there what happened when the priests and the elders and the kings did not teach the the law of God. What happened? Well, Hosea says this, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Let us not do the same thing today. Our job is to teach the word of God. We feed people the word of God. And that's why 1 Timothy 5, 17 says there are elders who labor in word and doctrine. And then we are to lead God's people by the word of God. There are many voices today, many people saying, this is the direction to go. This is the newest. This is the truest. Well, we have to lead people. And if we're going to lead people properly, we need to be guided by the word of God. Or we'll take the people in the wrong direction, which happens so easily. We are to provide right vision for the church, not wrong vision. We are to give right direction to the church. We are to set right attitudes in the church and, of course, right doctrine. And then we are to care for the flock. That's just the general, overall, practical care. We have to answer many, many questions. We have to counsel people. We have to guide families. There are so many troubles and problems people have. We have to be able to open the Word of God and answer these questions and guide people. So we are shepherds, we're people shepherds, and we do our job by means of the word of God, not our ideas, not our cleverness. This is our tool as shepherds of people. Now, what I want to turn to now is practical helps for reading the Holy Scripture. This will be the rest of our message and our next message. I want to deal practically with how can we become consistent, persistent Bible reading leaders. Let's look at some very practical ideas. Let's call this painfully practical. Now, we all know we need to exercise. And we all know we feel better when we exercise. But somehow we fail to exercise. And why is that? Most often we have no plan. Well, the same thing is true with reading the Bible. We know we should read the Bible more. We feel better when we read the Bible more. But why do we not consistently and persistently do this? because we don't have a plan. We actually don't know what we're doing. So let me give you some specific ideas because we live in a hyper busy world today, going at warp like speed. The first thing is this, develop a plan for regular discipline, Bible reading and study. 
So let me start here. If you have never read the whole of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, that's what you should do. Do it as quickly, as fast as you can, like reading a novel. Get through the whole book. It's a story, and you need to know the whole book. So that's the first thing you need to do. If you have never read the whole of the Bible, read it. Now, I would imagine most of you who are listening to me have read the whole Bible. You may have read it several times. So let me give you a philosophy of Bible reading that I think is very helpful. Many people actually don't have a plan for how to read, and they don't really understand how they should read. So let me give you some what I think is very important advice. If you read the Bible every year, which I know many Christians try to do, Genesis to Revelation, most people actually don't get all the way through. I know that. And you will only spend about eight weeks in reading the epistles. We're Christians. We are not Jews. The epistles are the final revelation of God, and particularly Paul's epistles. It interprets the whole rest of the Bible. So you need a plan that takes you every year through the epistles, Paul, Peter's, John, Jude, James, the, the major New Testament letters at least twice a year. So there should be daily heavy reading in the epistles. Now, I think realistically for most of you, you should read the Old Testament over a two or three year period. Like the first year, read the Pentateuch. In the Gospels, read two Gospels a year. Try to read Acts every year and Revelation, but you can even put that off to the following year. But every day you want to be reading and meditating on Paul's letters, John's letters, and Peter's letters. That is a better program than spending 80% of your year in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Leviticus, and that's why many of you never get through the whole Bible in a year. Now, we need to concentrate on those books in the Bible that we don't know very well, like Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Leviticus. So here's what I suggest. If you read the Old Testament in three years, you can read it in a slower way and you can have a commentary with you or you can use a good study Bible that has commentary in the footnotes so that you actually understand what you're doing. If you're reading through Jeremiah or if you're reading through Isaiah, you actually need to have an outline in front of you. This is what I, I, I tell people. Have the outline of the book of Isaiah because you will get lost in the book of Isaiah. If you're reading Jeremiah, it's not always in order. And so if you have a nice clear outline in front of you, you can get through Jeremiah and know where you are all the time. And then have some kind of very simple uh, commentary, either a one-volume commentary or a good study Bible that has notes. Read the introduction. Know where you are. Know what you're learning. Then you'll, you'll gain more than reading these big prophets, which most of us don't even know what they're talking about. So these are strategies for a consistent, persistent Bible reading program that will help you much, much more. Now, next, create a place and a time. Have a regular place in which you study. Now, this is my study right here. And I have in my desk all my pens and my color pens. I have paper. It's all right here. I have my Bible here. I have some of my notes things back here. Everything's right here. I sit down. I'm ready to go. One reason many of you don't read your Bible is you don't know where your Bible is. You're looking for it all the time. I know that because after Sunday morning, when church is over, people leave their Bibles at church. We have to put it in the lost and found. Someday I'm going to take those Bibles in lost and found and call the people and say, have you read your Bible today? Oh, no. I don't know why you didn't read your Bible today. Why? Because you don't have your Bible. It's here at church. I have everything right here. In fact, my good study Bible, I don't even take out of the house. I've lost two Bibles. It's a terrible feeling to lose your Bible with all your notes. So create a place. Now, let's say you, uh, you don't have a, uh, a nice study room. Maybe you have so many children, you don't know where to study. Well, then you get a briefcase like this, and you put your notes and your Bible and your pens and your paper all in here, and this way you carry it around and you can move it around. Maybe you want to study out in your car or read in your car or hide in the basement, whatever. You've got everything right with you. So you need to create a place where everything is, and that will encourage you to read the Word of God. And then a quiet place. Oh, I cannot emphasize this enough. We live with noise pollution all day. Studies have shown there's too much noise. Go walk out on your street sometime. You realize how noisy society is and the culture in which we live in. 
you need to learn quietness with God. When you're reading the word of God, you want it quiet because this is, as J.I. Packer said, God preaching to us. It is the voice of God. He speaks to us through his words. So you need to be quiet and meditate on it and see what God is teaching you. I uh, heard a story of a lady whose dog was just shaking all the time and shaking. She took it to a vet. They didn't know what to do. Took it to another vet. Didn't know what to do. And finally, a vet said, I've heard about this. Will you let me take your dog for a week? She said, sure. She said, can I come visit your house? She said, sure. So the, the man went to the, the house, the vet, and he uh, went through the house. The lady had four sons, four sons. So you can imagine this poor woman. And uh, TVs are going all over the house and uh, noise. And the kids are screaming and sword fighting and jumping from uh, couch to couch and uh, doing what uh, young boys do. So a week later, the man brought back the dog and the dog was perfectly calm. The lady said, what was wrong? He said, the animals cannot take all this noise. It's just noise pollution, toxicity from noise. You can turn your phone off. Did you know that? You will not be sinning if you turn your phone off. Turn your cell phone off. Turn the TV off. Turn the radio off. And go to your study. Go to your quiet place and sit with God in quietness. It will refresh your soul. It will renew you. I cannot express to you the importance of being alone with God and learning quietness. One of my most precious parts of my day is early, early in the morning, I make, a, I make a whole pot of, a pot of tea like this, and I have my glass with me, and I get my Bible early in the morning, and it's quiet. No one else is up. I do not answer the phone. I certainly don't watch TV, and I spend time with God. It, it just literally feeds me. It feeds me, and it stimulates my mind, and it, and it refreshes my heart, and, I, and I'm, I've got new strength for the day. I'm learning, I'm growing as I spend quiet time with God and refresh my weary soul. So I plead with you to find a quiet place. Turn the phone off. You don't have to be guilty about that. You have a phone answering machine. Be quiet with God. Listen to his voice. Learn the joy of being with the Lord's word and listening to him, refreshing your soul. I often take notes while I'm reading the Word of God. That's why I always have my, my paper here. I have little pads here, and I take notes, and, and thoughts come to me, and, and important verses that I've probably read before but not seen the way I see right now. And then I, I file them. I put them in different places. And then I have some of my commentaries nearby. And if it's a verse that's really perplexing me, I will uh, actually stop and just look up uh, what this means because I don't seem to understand it. I need some help from another brother who has studied the word far more than I have and more skilled than I am. And when I'm done with this time, it's very refreshing. I try often on Saturday morning to have even a longer time with the Lord uh, because I'm not under such pressure on Saturday. It's the day I like to take off. And so I get up very early. I come to my study. It is absolutely quiet. And I feed upon God and upon his word. And the Holy Spirit works through that. The Spirit loves the word. He gave us the word. He wants to speak to us through the word and convict us and warn us and threaten us and encourage us and build us up. And that's what the apostle said to the elders. He said, I'm committing you to the, the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. That's how we get strong and that's how we get knowledge and that's how we get the energy and the dynamic to do the job of shepherding people, it's not an easy job. It's a hard job. People drain you, but the word of God feeds you again. May this become a joy to you. May it be something no one has to force you into doing or making you feel guilty. May you run to the word and may you run to your quiet place. May you run to there and feed upon the living bread of God. Man will not live by physical bread alone, but by every word from God that is right at the beginning of the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy. And our Lord Jesus was a man who fed upon the word of God, and every time Satan tried to tempt him, he responded with scripture. Let us be consistent, persistent Bible reading leaders.